Hello, welcome to the February episode of Perspectives Live, a Colleges and Institutes Canada initiative, where we talk about and share different perspectives on what matters to you. Today's episode looks at the important topic of amplifying Black excellence. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja, and I wish to acknowledge that this episode of Perspectives Live is being produced and broadcast from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Before we get started, a CICAN would like to recognize the ongoing contributions of its corporate partners, Avis Budget, BGIS, Field Effect, and TD, who support CICAN, including bringing you this show, Perspectives Live. Let's kick things off. First, I'd like to invite Denise Amio, the president and CEO of CICAN, to join me for a quick chat. Hi, Denise. Good to see you again this, uh, this month. I know, so good to see you uh, as well. I, and really good to have you here. Tell me, I mean, this is such a significant topic beyond it being Black History Month. Why is to this topic so important for CICAN? As you know, Manjula, uh, these past few years have brought a reckoning of sorts uh, regarding anti-Black racism in North America and beyond. Um, mm -hmm. And we have 140 members dispersed across uh, the country. And we know that once a college or an institute says it's against uh, black racism and like that they are anti-black racism, then what? We know that mm -hmm. there are no quick fixes. And we, we always need to be mindful of moving beyond good intentions into effective action. And we know that no single line of actions can surface. And we, we believe that the first way to address this is by recognizing, fostering, and celebrating Black excellence. And, but not only for students. Uh, but also for staff in our post-secondary institutions and also for the communities around us. And, and this is across sectors. You know, this is interesting. If I understand you correctly, Denise, UNCI can are calling for a collective action, concerted action. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, CICAN understands that systemic issues need systemic answers. Uh, we know uh, that at the community level, for example, colleges and institutes have an important role to play. And I, I will dare to say a key role in re removing barriers. And we all know the importance of that and in amplifying Black excellence. And this role extends into the community, as I said before, and it involves collaborating with a variety of public and private sector organizations, but not just in February. It should mm -hmm. be all year round. Yeah, it's an important uh point that you've made about it being a conversation that we have now um, and these conversations have happened before but this is a a year-round effort denise thank you we'll see you back soon after the panel uh, denise will be back with a uh, gervin fearon he's the president of george brown college thank you let's move on now to our panel I, i'm really excited to kick this off let me start by introducing our panelists Pemberton Cyrus is the president of Imhotep's Legacy Academy and head of the Department of Industrial Engineering at Dalhousie University. Ray Williams is the co-founder and chair of the Black Opportunity Fund and vice chairman of National Bank Financial. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. So I mean, we have a lot to talk about here, but, but let me start here. Both of you have successful careers, but you're also heavily committed to these organizations that, that you work with. I'd love to hear more. So let's start there. Pemberton, what is the change that the Imhotep's uh, Legacy Academy hopes to make? Well, first of all, Imhotep's Legacy Academy is an outreach program for black kids in Nova Scotia to get them into STEM. So we focus specifically on STEM education, 
We've been around for 19 years. Um, we started with a Saturday physics workshop at 30 junior high kids. And we've now grown to serve over 1,500 students a year, even in the pandemic. Um, we focus on hands-on STEM experiences, scholarships, competitions, and we have been able to grow African Nova Scotia enrollment by 10 times in engineering and seven times in science, uh, among other faculties. And the main aim for us is just to see more black heads taken up STEM. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we just want to see more black heads around from the community in the universities and the colleges here yeah, and post-secondary education. Pemberton, those are those are impressive results. We should just take a moment to recognize that 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 this is what focused effort uh, creates. Ray, uh, talk to me about the vision of change at the Black Opportunity Fund. Yes, thank you. And um, before I start, let me just say um, I love uh, what has been undertaken by um, uh, Dr. Cyrus Pemberton um, uh, out there in the Maritimes. Uh, it is so important, especially for our young people, because um, we are being left behind in so many different areas. And when you look at the next evolving industrial revolution, which is around tech and the like, uh, the opportunity for our community to get engaged and narrow the gap that exists and is growing as it comes to as it speaks to wealth uh, in this country, this is one area where you have the opportunity to engage uh, with high paying jobs. Um, and I think that's so important, but more importantly, the idea of getting more young folks from the black community engaged in the sector. So Dr. Pemberton, thank you very much for the work that you're doing. Um, moving on, um, yes, Black Opportunity Fund. So what I will tell you about Black Opportunity Fund is that I've been blessed to have a number of really good people from community and business around me um, that have supported and encouraged a particular mindset and way of thinking around how we can best serve the Black community and the wider community that is Canada. Um, you know, I can sit here and, you know, underline a number of different areas in which uh, our community, generally speaking, is challenged. And so, you know, I think I just heard a really beautiful statement uh, from um, the president of uh, Colleges and Institutes of Canada, which was moving beyond good intentions to actions. And mm -hmm. for me, that's what this represents. The Black Opportunity Fund is all about how do we um, create access to capital for our various communities right across Canada and more specifically the different communities within that as it speaks to not-for-profits and charitable organizations quite often those organizations have been traditionally uh, the organizations that <clears throat> has provided support all around not only for the community that represents given societally but also for many of those who are trying to start a small business. So the idea here is to provide capacity and support and sustainability, long-term sustainability to uh, not-for-profits and, char uh, and charitable organizations within the community, uh, business entrepreneurs, because we've heard time and time again, the challenges they face in terms of access to capital. And, you know, there's a balanced conversation to be had here. I'm not going to go into it right now, but just to tell you that is a reality for a lot of black entrepreneurs. And also just look uh, more generally at where can we be investing within the black community? So, you know, you have a, a whole bunch of uh, different uh, funds out there right now that are looking to undertake investments with black entrepreneurs. So, you know, the venture piece, the equity piece is a piece that, you know, we would like to engage in as well, in part because many of us come from the financial services industry, uh, but that's just a, an overall part of the situation. Uh, we've been looking to undertake this and we've been at it now um, since June, 2020. So two years coming up and we've made some very substantial strides. Uh, partnerships have been of paramount importance because as we look to do the work, as we look to build uh, enough capacity for ourselves within the fund, we've had to engage with government. We've had to engage with corporate Canada, and we've had to engage 
with the charitable uh, foundations across Canada, because we see those three areas that are primary areas and sources uh, to get, get funding from. <clears throat> and the desire here is to create sustainability. Uh, you know, when I say create sustainability, right now, if you look, for instance, at um, not-for-profit or charitable organizations, uh, each year there's a, a fundraising round that takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, if they go to government, it's normally, you know, you've not finished doing the work for one year before you have to have your cap in hand uh, looking for funding for the next year. We want to do um, funding on a multi-year basis so that there is a little bit more long-term in terms of the view and less worry on an ongoing basis about uh, where is next year's budget going to come from. If you look at what's taking place right now, many announcements uh, over the course of the last year. A couple of days ago, you may note that Bank of Montreal uh, put out um, a really good press mm -hmm. release uh, indicating uh, its engagement and support for the Black community with a $100 million envelope. Black uh, Opportunity Fund was uh, engaged with them to provide, again, capacity building and really helping mentor those that have might failed initially at accessing funding you know what are their issues how can we create the groundwork for success in the in the next attempt that they undertake we've seen the same from cibc td has been very much in the lead uh, you know all the major banks are now making a very clear statement and what i will say to you here is very simply that this is not a zero-sum game engaging mm -hmm. and supporting the growth of the black community actually is net net beneficial and a win for all of canada and that is reflected and represented by again if we're able to close some of the wealth gap think about that for a moment more dollars in black wallets and pockets that's it's essentially you know an increase in gdp yeah that's an increase in buying power you know there may be some negative aspects to that especially when it comes to housing but right now the black community is so far behind in one of the greatest wealth creation aspects uh, of this century that we really need to change the narrative and again i'm going back uh to what uh, denise uh, has said which is moving beyond good intentions and actually taking action and this is what we see ourselves as uh doing and undertaking right now you know, it's interesting, you've, you've touched on a couple of themes there, the idea of collective action, and by collective action, beyond even the institutions that, that we know. So, you know, you've talked about partnering with banks to make things happen, partnering with government to, to, to make this happen. So let's talk about post-secondary institutions. Um, there was mm -hmm. this, this really interesting piece in the Globe and Mail uh, last weekend by pollster Nick Nanos about a nano survey that was looking at how satisfied Canadians are with Canada as a country. I, I won't go get into what they said because some of it is is not that great, but there was one thing that stood out to me. Um, participants in the survey were, were asked which institutions they thought could make Canada a better country. And here are the top three spots. Number three was the Supreme Court. Number two was the healthcare system. And number one was post-secondary institutions. So, so I'm going to put this question out to both of you. Um, I'll, I'll start with Pemberton. Let's talk big picture. What is the role that you think post-secondary institutions can play in fostering Black excellence? Well, uh, first of all, um, you have to understand how post-secondary institutions are organized. Um, all of these institutions tend to be organized on the, in the idea of a college or um, so which is means collegiality so the essentially it's um thousand, a thousand equals basically running an organization um and so within that you tend to have organizations of um, of black staff or black students and so on arising um and those organizations exist to support the black students and uh, sometimes the black staff and so on. Now, these are tend to be self-organized. And uh, I think the most important role that the post-secondary institutions could play, uh, could take here is really in terms of providing financial and organizational support and generally staying out of the way of what organizations do. Because usually those organizations know what they're doing they know their target audience and they know what they have to do to get new students in and to in increase the representation of um, black people in organizations. 
So generally, probably one of the best things a post-secondary institution could do is provide maximum support and then let things happen. Uh, sometimes too much intervention tends to stifle the work of law organizations leading to limited success. So for example, with Imhotep's Legacy Academy, we exist within Dalhousie and we are supported mm -hmm. nicely financially and with good infrastructure and so on. But we are free to design the programs we want and to operate the way we want to, to get to the black students. And that's where we get a benefit. In fact, um, the way Imhotep's Legacy Academy operates is that basically all of our programs are designed and run by students themselves. So they're designed and run by students within the institution, reaching out to students in, post, in, um, in the secondary level and sometimes in the elementary level. And that works quite well because there are not enough Black staff to be able to do that job. And so using Black students to do that job means that we have enough capacity to reach out to all of the students in the community. I would imagine it's also quite empowering for these students to take their lived experiences and their knowledge and be able to, to create change in this way. Well, exactly. The, in fact, um, what we find is that the, the post-secondary students involved in our programs are very successful in their post-secondary education and they, they're very persistent in their post-secondary education. Um, in addition to, of course, all of the benefits that you have for the secondary students and for the elementary students. And it's something we saw from the beginning of Imhotep's Legacy Academy, you know, almost 20 years ago, that all of these students involved in the program tended to do very well. And it wasn't just a matter of us choosing the best students, but you choose good students to work in an organization, and then they became spectacular. So, you know, we have people who worked with us who are now on faculty, we have people who work in, uh, you know, in research positions. Uh, I remember at one point we had one of our staff members whose dream was to to work on a research ship, um, do, doing ocean, you know, ocean science, and she did exactly that. You know, she was out there working. Then now she's working at a research institute. Um, we have dent people who did, do did dentistry, medicine, all of that. So, you know, some of them came in through our programs, but some of them were actually our mentors who, who were That's mentoring just, the secondary students. It's fascinating but because what you've created in a way is a hub that empowers the people that are involved, but also is in a way sustainable because it's creating sort of future mentors and future sponsors and funders and all of those things, which, which I think is always incredible to see uh, in any kind of organization. Ray, um, I'm going to get you to weigh in here. Uh, you know, there's so many areas where colleges and institutes could spark change, you know, perceptions, uh, awareness of history, uh, inspiring entrepreneurship, and even really practical things like creating a, a rich pipeline of graduates, let's say. There's so much. What would you like to see uh, these institutions do across the country? Well, again, we, we, we go back to the, um, the whole notion of systemic change. We go back to the notion of um, partnerships. And, you know, um, so it, it's interesting that uh, that uh, Dr. Gavin Ferron uh, will be participating shortly. Um, I'm actually a graduate of George Brown College in the culinary mm -hmm. arts program uh, as part of mm -hmm. continuing education. And one of the things that I noted was how, as someone who loves restaurants, how restaurants all around the downtown core uh, in large part would engage with George Brown College, where some of the young uh, folks that were undertaking the culinary arts program uh, to go into a professional capacity could actually undertake uh, training with, you know, very high quality restaurants. So there, right there, you sort of recognize and see partnership. And I think that's a really important uh, uh, thing because it creates real impact. And it's just really also very neat to hear what, again, what uh, uh, Pemberton uh, mentioned earlier on, that that participation that you saw uh, from many of the students ended up being a, a key component of their mindset going forward. So I think, you know, if, we, if we're looking for systemic change, um, everything from 
why aren't we teaching, uh, uh, you know, black history, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, within our colleges, our institutes, our, our schools? Um, you know, why aren't we seeing more uh, financial literacy courses from a very young age right through, um, which uh, will serves many purposes along the way? Uh, so there's a there's a huge amount that that can be done in my estimation, and I can understand very clearly why the poll that you presented would show uh, that colleges and institutes uh, represent a trusted source. Because at the end of the day, education is key. It absolutely is. I state that from mm -hmm. lived experience as you know, a young kid growing up uh, initially in the islands and then uh, in London. Uh, brought up by uh, a single mother, I'm the eldest of five children. If it wasn't for the opportunity and access provided by education, I would not have been in the position to go on to do an undergrad, a postgrad, and possibly be here talking with you today. So mm -hmm. for me, it is a, is a supremely important aspect, component, and part of what we should be doing and another reason good reason why you know uh, post-secondary uh, education be, should be heavily supported and supported as again i mentioned this from a systemic standpoint by partners all around it's interesting because uh this takes us into a a segue about um about talking about allies. So, so Pemberton, I'm going to put that to put that to you. What do you see as the role of allies at post-secondary institutions in in you know taking away barriers and and boosting the representation of Black Canadians both on campus and and across other sectors? Yeah, the yeah, allies are very important, and one of the reasons is as you as you go further and further up the hierarchy in any of these institutions, you'd see less and less black people. And if you have less black people, then of course you have less opportunity for mentorship. Um, if you want, for example, if a black person wants a black mentor, there probably isn't a black mentor available. So allies are very important in providing that um, environment and that pool of people and a pool of mentors to work with. Um, and it's important for anyone sort of moving up in leadership positions to be able to find the people who will provide them with the appropriate amount of support and to then use them as mentors. Um, and it's also important for allies to put themselves out there, to make themselves available so that as you know, black leader up the, the ranks, they have people that they, they can look to and look mm. to for support. Um, and this is as very, very important for the, the top levels of any of these organizations, because ask yourself, how many black people do you see there? And so if people are looking for mentors, who will they turn to? Now, uh, you touched on, Ray, you touched on partnerships. And uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the things we have to remember is that I don't think you want institutions working up, working and coming up with ideas in, in isolation. What kind of partnerships should they, should they be leaning towards that could be the most promising in fostering change all through the year? Well, look, I, I do believe that when you undertake partnerships, if you create a sufficiently good dialogue, uh, what you can end up with is substantially more than the constituent parts. Um, mm -hmm. And everyone brings a, a perspective, a certain amount of experience to the situation. And it's always interesting when you choose to actually just listen to what is being said to you uh, to get an understanding of where that impact might be. So that's, that's a really important thing. If you can really establish uh, partnerships in a way um, where there is an, op an opportunity for really good constructive dialogue, uh, I think that can drive a whole bunch of change. And again, we cannot have anything that might come even close to systemic change without having um, you know that type of partnerships and 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 they will they will cross any number of different areas right because we're talking social political economic mm -hmm. uh, all of those uh, you know it's one of the things that we see increasingly in the area of ESG for instance that you know it doesn't matter who you are what you think about the situation the reality is if um, some of the 
targets that have been set, whether it be for 2030 or 2050, are ever going to be achieved, the only way you're going to uh, undertake um, and get even close to uh, those targets is engaging in meaningful partnerships across a whole bunch of uh, different uh, aspects of our society. You know, I, I wonder if that that is a that is a heavy weight on community organizations as well. Who are the people that are on the ground that understand what's needed, and now they're being, you know, I'm sure they want to be heard, but but it's also an effort to to be involved in these kinds of partnerships. I just I want you to speak to that because I do think that it involves at some point institutions partnering with community organizations, not just the Correct. private sector. Correct. So, um, look, there are. Uh, I'm in the financial services sector, and there are uh, any number of uh, banks right now that have, and one in particular, that has been very consistent about how it's engaged different communities. And it is a clear reflection to my mind of them understanding uh, their stakeholders, their customers and how they can drive a process that is net beneficial. Because when you create um, strong branding in the same way, uh, Manjula, that you, you referenced uh, colleges and, and, institu and institutes being very trusted, it is very important for organizations to create the type of brand that is looked upon and appreciated and trusted. And so it's very smart branding and marketing when corps undertake that in a way that engages community at the grassroots level, right? Uh, you know, it creates a change in perspective, I believe, uh, that actually serves not only the community well, but ultimately serves uh, the, uh, the the corporate or the bank uh, really well. Um, it's It ends up being something that uh, I think is beneficial all round and, you know, you can't step away from when you see beneficial outcomes of that nature. It's a, a win for community because uh, that partnership is driving uh, some of the outcomes. And it's a win for the organization, the corporate that's looking to undertake that partnership. Because, like I said, it's sort of reflected glory, if you will. Uh, but nonetheless, it, you know, it makes a very, very big statement. Mm, that, is, that is definitely the, uh, an interesting approach. Now, before I bring on our other two panelists, I do, um, I do have this question for you, uh, both of you. Uh, you you're both these inc incredible leaders. You have incredible careers. Uh, I don't want to miss an opportunity here. What practical advice would you have for young Black leaders at Canada's colleges and, and institutes? Uh, Pemberton, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think the most important advice is to find a mentor. Um, mm. So anybody moving up in leadership needs to have a mentor. And that's because um, some aspects of leadership you don't want to learn by example. You, um, or, you, you, or you don't want to learn by experience, let's put it that way. Mm. So you, you don't want to make mistakes in leadership to become a leader you you want to mm. to know what the consequences of, of your actions would probably be and so then you really do need a good mentor to help guide you so i think probably the most important thing for anyone moving up in leadership is find a good mentor find somebody who could guide you and as i was saying before you know you know it could be an ally um but you know it's somebody who knows the job who can guide you to, to through through the ranks and is invested in your success as well yeah exactly uh ray um i'm gonna kind of tailor that question to you a, a little bit differently yeah, uh, no i problem. know that you're affiliated with the hundred strong foundation a fantastic mm -hmm. group a, a group of male black professionals that, that work with youth what is your advice for young black leaders at these institutions around the use of building a network or network uh, networking to cultivate excellence? So what I'll tell you is, is that in my lived experience, my observation, uh, networking is probably one of the most powerful tools available um, to young black leaders. And I, I feel quite often it's one that's underutilized. 
um, networks uh, like literally gardening, you know, you, you plant something, you have to nurture it, you have to water it, um, sometimes you have to prune it. But the reality is that you need to participate. That participation, again, is key. And building your networks, you have to think about it from that perspective. Um, I think I've been blessed over the years in the fact that because I've networked extensively, I have people that have provided me with sponsorship, mentorship, and has opened doors to me simply because they understood me because I'd had the opportunity to engage with them uh, from a networking standpoint. And networking doesn't have to be necessarily about you know, um, anything more than sometimes a short conversation, staying in touch, uh, when you have an ask, making it a, a doable ask, I make it a, a short ask. Uh, mo you, most, most folks are very willing to accommodate a small ask, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's a simple introduction. So I think your, your network uh, ends up being a substantial component um, of how you can drive success because you then end up with quite a wide number of people who have inverted quote invested in you wanting to see you succeed and so it is worth the time and effort to uh spend uh ensuring that like i said you water the garden it's interesting it's it's uh you know something my mom says is you don't you don't pick up the you don't plant the seeds when you need the beans right you you have to start Correct. long before that and uh, and I, I i really love the way that you've really painted that uh, thank you I, i'd like to bring in our two other guests into this conversation now uh, denise amio is president and ceo of ci can and uh and uh our our, our new panelist here gavin Fearon is president of george brown college thank you both for joining us I, I'm so glad to have both of you on. Uh, Denise, there, there's so much we've just heard from uh, from Pemberton and Ray. What do you think of what they've laid out? <laughs> I, I just love what they were saying with respect to the importance of having allies, mentors, mm -hmm. networks also, and work in partnerships, because at the end of the day, this is what colleges and institutes are all about. And there are a number of initiatives in the country uh, to encourage uh, and help both communities and students and staff. Uh, Gervin will talk about some of them, but I'll come back to talk about others in the country. Uh, Gervin, I, I think she's, she's already pulled you into the conversation. <laughs> so talk to me uh, about yeah. some, of those, some of those programs. Um, why don't I, I first start off by making a comment on what I heard and then talking about some of the programs as well. But I, I think the two guests and two colleagues, uh, in terms of what they've outlined, uh, they've outlined really a program of action and, and part of that program of action, whether at the college level or the institute or university level, or whether in partnership with uh, the corporate sector by way of example, um, but really being able to articulate how uh, a program of action not only benefits uh, members of the black community, um, but benefits Canada as a whole. And I think as we think through what's been discussed here is a, a bit of a vision of Canada as a inclusive society. Uh, mm -hmm. So in, in that regard, uh, on some of the actions that have been taken uh, at the college level and at the institute level, uh, a few stages of that is that I, I think that a, a lot of work has gone into first uh, engaging uh, the college community, the institute community, in being able to get a tab on uh, where we are today. And some of that has quite often been uh, looked at through a task force or through uh, reports on, on anti-black racism or inclusiveness and the likes to be able to get a, a tab of where the institution is and then to generate a set of recommendations. Uh, next, taking those recommendations and moving that into a, a set of actions and program of actions with key performance indicators, with key role statements as to who does what and where and why. 
um, and then to spell that out as a multi-year uh, agenda. I think as well, your point earlier in terms of how post-secondary educational institutions are ranked and viewed as important as societal institutions is being able to recognize um, our institutions as leaders and that gives us an, an opportunity both internally and externally to be um, exemplars as to what are the things that we can do to set a pace and a beat for the opportunities for society to be able to see what we're doing internally and to say that they can adopt those practices and move forward as a society. And I think collectively, we all benefit from, from taking some of those um, actions by way of example. Well, it's interesting because you've actually laid a roadmap for how an institution can, can go about and do this. Denise, would you like to add to that? Oh, I will uh, just uh, talk about uh, maybe some of the the ways that some of the institutions across the country are, are doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, in Alberta at Northwest College, uh, they have an Institute for Inclusive Leadership. And uh, what it does, in fact, it offers services that encourage and support organizations uh, in uh, developing and sustaining in cultures. So the reasons I chose this one, it's not only about what's happening in the college, but it's also about what they can do in their communities to support initiatives uh, that relate either to black excellence or anti-racism or diversity or inclusion. On the other uh, spectrum, you have Collège de Maisonneuve, uh, which is in Montreal, that have uh, an applied research center, if you want, uh, but that is all about anti-racism, diversity and inclusion. And what they do, they develop a set of best practices uh, that can help and guide not only what's happening in post-secondary institutions, but also, again, in communities and looking at, you know, what are those best practices and how could they be uh, amplified? Uh, you, I'll just mention the last one uh, from the other side of the country, uh, considering that Pemberton is in Halifax. So this one is in Vancouver. So it's Vancouver Community College wh who decided in its four strategic pillars to put reconciliation and uh, diversity as one of their pillars. So it means it's influencing everything they do into their institution. So all that to say there are a number of initiatives across the country, because we're talking about serious business here. We're talking about the future of the country. So it's important that we embrace those initiatives. Denise, are the learnings and the best practices from each of these uh, programs and these institutions, is there some way that they're being shared? Ha -ha. Thank you for saying this. I'm very happy I... because... Uh, oh no, did I open up one hour? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be quick. I'll be quick. This was not a planted question, by the way. Um, so basically, uh, what we're doing right now, we have embarked into this big initiatives called Impact ADI, so Equity, mm -hmm. Diversity, Inclusion. Mm -hmm. And part of this is that we're guided by an advisory committee made up of representatives of our members. And we are uh, putting in place a community of practice so that practitioners, faculty, administrators, even students could be part of it and in fact share best practices and look also at what is missing so that we can develop and support uh, new tools that can help them in their journey. And what's interesting is that uh, Ray earlier um, not that you need a business case for this, but he did because he's a he's a businessman, a successful businessman. He did make a business case for it as well. I, I just wonder um, if there is either resistance or are there challenges to taking action here? Um, I'll let either of you answer that. What are, what are the challenges mm -hmm. to, to taking action here? So why don't I start in on that? And I, I, I think that there are three challenges. The first one is being able to recognize what is the imperative. 
And um, part of that, by way of example, there was a study and that I was a part of uh, some years ago that took a look at the wage gap and what was also called the occupational gap. The idea that individuals having the core competency, um, but not necessarily getting the compensation or not getting the promotion. Uh, that tallied up to about $1.5 billion in terms of lost income to members of the Black community. Uh, that imperative means that there's a significant impact on families and on uh, wealth distribution within Canada. And consequently, what that also means is a disincentive for individuals pursuing post-secondary. should just make mention, when you take a look at the stats, though, for the Black community, uh, the uh, stats actually demonstrate at the graduate level, at the, at the degree level, that, that the community is actually uh, performing at a, a very high level. Uh, relative to overall um, population distribution. So there isn't a fully a gap in that regard, but there's still a uh, disincentive. Uh, what that also means is that that also has a huge impact on, on Canada's uh, overall competitiveness and our ability to be able to meet uh, what might be called full or potential economic uh, outcomes and prosperity. So that's part of the imperative, and I don't think that people quite often recognize uh, that there is a substantial cost to discrimination and racism uh, in um, Canadian society that's costing us. So that's the first imperative. The second one, I think, though, um, is from the point of view of our, our capacity uh, that we uh, actually have internally within our institutions and as individuals uh, the capacity to make a difference um, regardless of what our role is. And uh, that sense of empowerment uh, in terms of being able to address the imperative becomes the second one. Uh, finally, I, I think the, the third item that I would uh, like to be able to, to emphasize is, is uh, being able to recognize that there are a lot of success elements. And I think that you heard of um, some today already. Uh, so that, that way we aren't going out and creating brand new uh, we're actually having the ability to share best practices, share promising practices. And I can tell you here at George Brown College, um, I've been really pleased and proud about some of the outstanding work being done, uh, not only in terms of planning, in terms of thoughtfulness, but actually engaging the entire college in being a part of um, the impetus to results. Uh, so those kinds of items, I, I think being able to share uh, results and best practices, mm -hmm. and then be able to take a look at how we're transforming Canadian society and why that's so important, not only for us internally, um, but being able to showcase Canada at a global level as to why it is that we should retain and attract outstanding um, talent and people um, for building a, a, a really um, uh, best and, and promising society. Denise, so, can, Manjula, I can, can I Yes, please do. Sorry, yes. sorry Manjula. I'd just like to follow up um, because I think the, some of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Fearing just shared with us is re really, really mm -hmm. important to understand and acknowledge. Um, you know, the notion of the wage gap, the notion of mm -hmm. the occupational gap, they also have multiply effects for the Black community. Obviously, uh, it, it ends up being negative. And that has been reflected very clearly in some of the most recent research. I think it was uh, RBC Wealth Management uh, brought out a small paper recently that showed very clearly that because the black community is not sufficiently engaged in house ownership, that over the course, course of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, you know, potentially they've lost about $100 billion. That's not me mm -hmm. saying that. This is research undertaken by uh, RBC. And so it goes to show that the, um, as uh, what is the uh, the phrase, uh, Dr. Furious, the imperative uh, is so very, very important because mm -hmm. you can have so many multiplier uh, effects through this that actually worsens the situation for those within the overall community that is Canada that are economically challenged. What's interesting because I think I, I think that the pandemic has also accelerated those gaps, right? Um, so, Denise, right. you just heard what what uh, what Ray said as well. We were talking about the imperative here. Uh, talk to me because you you have a vast network of of leaders across the country that you speak to at post secondary institutions. What are the challenges around acting on this? 
Um, and I would say that there are a number of challenges. First, uh, sometimes people think they have to reinvent the wheel, which we don't. Mm -hmm. They don't need. That's why we are creating this uh, community of practice. Uh, the other challenge is that it's one of governance. And uh, earlier we talked about the importance of role models. But in fact, when you look at the governance of an institution, it's very important to ensure that it, it be representative. It be representative from a, a board perspective. Uh, it be a board of governors perspective, for example, for college. Uh, it has to be representative from a staff perspective, from an administrator's perspective, because if people don't see themselves, you know, they, 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 they won't have a model to aspire to. And we all know how important this is. We talked about the lack of mentor uh, at one point. Uh, I think it was Ray that mentioned this, or maybe both uh, of you that the uh, 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 Copperton that uh, mentioned it as well. So for for me, it, uh, that's why, in fact, we signed the 50-30 uh, challenge. Uh, mm. For our audience, the 50-30 challenge is an initiative, the national initiatives put in place by the government of Canada. And it's all about ensuring uh, representation. So 50-50 meaning 50 women, 50% of men on board as well as on management, and 30% at least diversity, both for board again and management. And I'm pleased to report that us at CICAN, we want to be a role model. So we are doing it at the board and management, uh, at the board level uh, and management for, for mm. gender. Uh, uh, for diversity, we are doing it at the board level and we're missing like a leg and a half arm at the management level. So we're not there yet, yet, uh, but working on it. And so and part of our initiatives on Impact ADI will be how can we increase that representativity and how also can we help communities around us and the business sector and nonprofit sector to also embrace the 50-30 challenge because mm -hmm. it's a question we, we heard about it earlier of wealth it's a question of uh, equity and social justice at the end of the day so um, we've covered a, a couple of things here. I'm, I, because I heard um, Dr. Firon actually talk about certain things that are that are that are happening at George Brown College. I I want to touch on those before I open up the uh, the question to any uh, open up the panel to any other comments. Dr. Firon, tell me about some of the things that it sounds like you're trying a couple of things at George Brown Colli College. What are you seeing that that you know is that is has some little bit of traction or is a success story or, or really a, a good practice that you'd like to pass on to others sure uh what i have uh, seen already done and referred to it at, at a conceptual level before a study was done uh, a couple years ago that that provided a bit of a benchmark to be able to say we're that was a starting point but more recently uh there have been uh, developed a, a number of action plans one uh action plan around uh anti um, black racism and around um, anti-racism initiatives and another one uh, around uh, indigenous initiatives and uh, both of those uh, strategic plans have been uh, aimed at answering the question that we know that there's a commitment at an institutional level in principles and in concept um, but being able to answer the question what can you do and um, what those action plans have, have outlined is it's to provide a structure all the way up and down the ladder of the institution on what each person can do, what each component of the institution can do in being able to affect a change as well as being able to affect a more inclusive uh, college environment. And as a result, then we've taken a look at our teaching and learning program, our research programs, how we engage students, how we um, support faculty and employees uh, across uh, the institution and making sure that we have touch point um, action plans with um, definitive outcomes that we're trying to reach uh, that then we can then implement and as well as build partnership 
and roles right across the entire institution. I think that kind of action plan uh, that allows individuals to see themselves in action in, in support of the principal items uh, really uh, is a characteristic of the kind of work that's being done. And I think it's, it's very leading edge in that context. Uh, many institutions um, are still at the first phase of that, um, being able to get a benchmark as to where they are, getting the recommendations and contemplating how do they now move into action where we are is we're actually into the action phase, including doing the training and the education that was referred to um, before uh, by others, making sure that we all do have a baseline understanding of equity, we have a baseline understanding of diversity, and a baseline understanding of, in, of inclusion. Similarly, that we have a, a baseline understanding of Indigenous knowledge, um, and as well as the role uh, that each of, of those contexts have played in the shaping of Canada, and uh, why that's important as we go forward, uh, that it needs to be a part of the shaping of our institution, as well as Canada as a whole. Now, it's interesting. I, I wonder how you measure change uh, with that kind of work. Is it, do you have metrics? I, I know that sounds really simple, but is it enrollment metrics? How do you measure progress with this work? Why don't I give uh, three examples? Uh, I, I think uh, one in terms of enrollment metrics, um, by way of example, I think that we need to and will be um, measuring on the number of Indigenous students uh, that both apply and that enroll. Uh, the diversity of our student body uh, will be another metric. Mm -hmm. uh, a second metric um, will be on the distribution of our employees uh, across uh, the entire institution. Uh, and interestingly enough, when I take a look at, at the distribution of our, our, our employees, let's say at the decanal level, so our deans, we have an incredibly diverse um, uh, dean pool of, of individuals, so very representative uh, pool. Uh, at our senior management level, also making sure that we're sensitive uh, to diversity in its full spectrum um, at our senior management level, and then making sure that we're putting in place the mentorship programs, um, but not only having mentorship where we're providing um, concepts as to leadership by example uh, that my colleague um, Pemberton um, uh, alluded to, um, but we're also saying uh, if you develop those leadership skills, where does that lead you to next? So making sure that we're opening up um, those opportunities, whether it's leading committees, uh, whether it's promotion and, and those kinds of opportunities. So it, it's also leadership to results in that context. The last one I would say is uh, the communities that we in, um, engage as a college. Uh, we're quite often engaged with the business community and other community organizations and the likes. Uh, we've, we're starting to stand back and ask ourselves, how representative um, are, um, does that re engagement look like? And are we making sure, especially as we come through the COVID period and the recovery, are we making sure that we're providing our institutional capacity uh, to all communities across uh, the uh, GTA Toronto and beyond, and to make sure that we're, we're being inclusive in terms of supporting uh, business success and community success as well. So it's both internal and external, and we're putting metrics against each of those as well. I'll just say for everyone who's been trying furiously to make notes as Dr. Firhan was throwing out all of these ideas, there is a recording of this that you'll be able to access because there's so much wealth right there in that answer. Um, I have, I think we have a, a couple of minutes left, about two to three minutes left. I'm going to go back to, to Pemberton and, and Ray. And uh, I just, uh, very quickly, um, post-secondary institutions are such an important part of the larger community uh, that they serve and they do actually wield um, quite a bit of influence they have a lot of influence at their at their disposal at their disposal uh, at their disposal sorry what a what, how do you want them to wield that influence beyond the college and institute's environment throughout the country to make a difference for Black Canadians? I know that can be a very tough thing to put into about a minute each, but, but uh, Pemberton, I'll start with you and then we'll end with Ray. How would you like institutions to, to wield the influence that they have to, for greater good? Well, I'm not sure that, that this is really answering the question. But I just want to touch on one idea, the value of diversity. And that is one area I think that um, institutions can help in, in illustrating the value of diversity. And um, in that, um, 
I've been involved in engineering design now for probably, you know, 30 plus years. And what I've observed from teaching engineering is that the, the teams that have diversity actually end up having better ideas than teams that don't have diversity. And by, by diversity, I mean any type of diversity. And this case is diversity of thought. If you grow up in a different type of community, you will come to the team with a different kind of experience and a different set of ideas. And I think we undervalue how important that is. And if you question uh, the value of diversity, I'd suggest you look at Apple Computer, or well, Apple now, they don't know it, no long call themselves Apple Computer, but they started out with diversity in that Steve Jobs and Steve was in a completely different backgrounds. And by putting them together, you now have this multi-trillion dollar company sitting there producing the best, you know, the best devices on the planet. The, the, for Canada to survive, we need to use our diversity for innovation. And if we want to innovate, we have to use our diversity for that purpose. So it's not only about equity, it's about using diversity. Ray. Yeah, gosh, that's a big one to unravel, um, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, but I'll give it a go from my, my experience um, sitting at the George Brown College Foundation Board. Um, they take us through a really interesting, um, you know, sort of get to know George Brown College over the course of eight, nine months um, by allowing us to be engaged with a lot of the different uh, departments and their deans. And so you learn an awful lot. And I've been continually surprised and shocked at the extent to which a college like George Brown uh, extends itself into the community and creates partnerships in different ways. And when I say community, I'm talking about the wider community. So the corporate partnerships, the partnerships overseas with other colleges and institutes, um, and on and on and on within, you know, the more specific professional spaces. And so to my mind, that speaks volumes about how you create systemic change, okay? Because you are getting uh, input from those folks who are vocational and out there practicing, and then you're getting the opportunity to have your student body engage directly uh, with those organizations, those companies, and those communities. So I think even more of that will actually drive the process and actually kind of, in some respects, speaks to exactly what Pemberton has said, because it speaks to diversity. It speaks to diversity this time in terms of where you reach into, who you reach into, and what's coming back to you. So I'll keep it as simple as that. Oh, that's a great note to, to, to end the panel on. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thank you to all of you. And quickly, a, a news update. As, as uh, Denise mentioned, CICAN is proud to be chosen as one of the five 5030 Challenge ecosystem partners. The 5030 Challenge is this federal initiative that encourages Canadian organizations to increase the representation and inclusion of diverse groups within their workplaces, uh, while also highlighting the value of, of giving all Canadians a seat at the table. To learn more or, or to sign up for the challenge if your organization hasn't done so already, you can go to the 5030 Challenge, your uh, diversity advantage, which is at Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. And of course, if you want to stay on top of exciting initiatives like this within or for the post-secondary sector led by CICAN, the federal government, national and international stakeholders, subscribe to CICAN's free bi-monthly newsletter, Perspectives. And hey, we'd love to hear your perspectives on our discussion today. Please do drop us a line at the address appearing on your screen, live at collegesinstitutes.ca. 
and uh, to our panelists, Pemberton Cyrus, Ray Williams, Garavan Firon, and Denise Amio, thank you. Uh, you are all so frank and and thoughtful. Again, we could have spoken for hours. I'm I'm so glad you made the time uh, to share your your thoughts with us. And to the mm -hmm. rest of you, thank you for tuning in and and join us next month. Circle off Wednesday, March the 16th for our next Perspectives Live on the topic. The future is female. Have a great week. Read up on Black history in Canada and stay safe.